Hello and a very warm welcome to our St. Debs Church service, wherever you are. I hope some of you have been able to get away and have a bit of a break during these summer months. Maybe some of you have been in France and you've had to dash back. Well, whatever you're doing and wherever you are, may the Lord bless you richly. It's been an anxious time for many, financially perhaps, in our health, exam worries. I hope you A-level students got what you needed for the next step. And uh, we're very conscious of you GCSE students waiting for, result, for results this week. In all our concerns, it's wonderful to know that we have a God who is completely powerful. He's the awesome creator of the world and full of love. And he's in loving control of the universe. Let me pray as we begin. Loving Father, how we praise you that you are in complete control. We're conscious that we're out of control. We have our concerns, and at times we can't work out what is going on. But we pray through this service, build our trust in you and encourage us to keep living for you in the midst of all the uncertainties that we might bring much honour and glory to your name. And we pray for your name's sake. Amen. Our first song is a song of praise to our mighty Creator God who loves us and cares for us. All praise to Him, the God of light, who formed the mountains by His might. All praise to Him, who names the stars that sing His fame. Skies afar. All praise to Him who reigns in love, who guides the galaxies above. Yet bends to hear our every prayer with sovereign power and tender care. All praise to him whose love is seen in Christ the Son, the servant King, who left behind his glorious throne to pay the ransom for his own. All praise to him who humbly came to bear Yes, God is worthy of our thanks and adoration and praise, and yet, very sadly, we don't respond to him as we should. And it's right always when we consciously draw into his presence that we confess our sins. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Let's spend a moment of quiet as we think maybe of particular ways in which we've disobeyed Almighty God. And then we'll join together in the prayer that's coming on the screens now. Together we pray. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Do you remember that wonderful promise? If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we trusted in Christ, well, that moment, all our sins were forgiven and cleansed, past, present, even future. And in Christ, we could not be cleaner. We're completely pure. And that's a truth we celebrate in our next song. Jesus paid it all. What an amazing Saviour we have. God is the saving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, united in a mission of love. And we're going to express our faith in that one saving God in the words of this creed. Together we say, We believe in God the Father, who has revealed his love and kindness to us, and in his mercy saved us, not for any good deed of our own, but because he is merciful. We believe in Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to free us from our sin and set us apart for himself, a people eager to do good. We believe in the Holy Spirit, 
whom God poured out on us generously through Christ our Saviour, so that justified by grace we might become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Amen. If you've been watching over the last couple of Sundays, you'll know that we brought our harvest offering a little earlier this year because of the very great needs that we're conscious of around the world as a result of COVID. And we're giving towards three different projects linked to three of our overseas partners to support Christians in their ministry to help those particularly affected financially by the COVID crisis. Two weeks ago, we heard of a project in India. Last week, Matt Pope told us about a project in Chile. And in just a moment, Annabel Hayward's going to introduce another project before Annabel leads us in our prayers. Details of how you can give to these harvest offerings and the offerings will be split between the three projects are found on our St. Ebbs website. Now Annabel Haywood, who's on our staff team here at St. Ebbs, is going to lead us in our prayers. For our harvest offering, one of our overseas partners has shared a particular need with us. She can't appear online for security reasons, but she's written to us. She writes, My housemate has been a follower of Jesus for 11 years. She came to Christ from a Muslim background and her family rejected and threatened her when she told them. But over the years, God has enabled her to rebuild the relationship. She has 14 siblings and an adopted baby brother, most of whom still live at home. She longs for her family to come to Christ. In May, during lockdown, she got a call in the middle of the night from her sister, frantic, because the family home was on fire, so we drove out to the house together. The fire brigade had come, but sadly two of her neighbour's children had already died and their house burned to the ground. My housemate's family were all safe, but the kitchen, toilet and three rooms had burned, along with many of their possessions. You can see some of the damage in the picture. The houses were built of wood and corrugated iron, both of which burn easily. My housemate would like to rebuild a three-bedroomed house for her family with concrete blocks, which are more stable and secure against fire. She's asking for financial help to pay for the construction. It would be a great encouragement to her to know that the wider body of Christ is involved in the project and is praying for the Lord to build his house in her family and neighbourhood. It will cost about £11,200 to build a three-bedroomed house. She has asked a number of Christian friends to help share the cost. We're now going to turn to pray and we'll pray for Faith and her family, for government, for those facing change and for those who are sick and suffering. And our prayers will be taking words from Psalm 130. And that starts, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray for Faith, who must be calling to you from the depths with the tragedy of her family home being burnt down and the dreadful suffering of her neighbours. We pray for strength and courage, for ongoing trust in you, and we pray that you would provide all she and her family need for a new home that will be safer and healthier for them. But even more, Lord, we cry for mercy for her family and neighbours and others in the country to come to know you and the Lord Jesus Christ and so have an eternal home with you. We pray for perseverance for faith in praying for her family, and we thank you that she is re reunited with them. We pray too for wisdom and faithfulness for our overseas partner and the team as they seek to support faith and others in following you. We thank you too for the privilege of giving to those in great need. We pray for the grace of giving knowing that we only give from what you have provided. Please bless those who receive these gifts 
and mercifully provide jobs, training, education and homes for those in such hard conditions in India, Africa and Chile, where there is little or no other support. Please may many turn and trust in the Lord Jesus and enjoy the new life that he brings. In his name. Amen. Lord God, we pray too for mercy for those in government around the world. Please give them wisdom and humility and a desire to serve the people of the countries and areas they govern. No human knows the future, so we plead with you for guidance so that people may be cared for, have work to do and have opportunities to hear the gospel. We pray too for the people. We pray that they, we, would engage with government wisely and well, supporting good decisions, resisting wrong ones in constructive ways, so that there is less strife and more cooperation for the good of all around the world. Lord, have mercy. We acknowledge we are not in control and we all need your help. In Jesus' name, Amen. In Psalm 130, it writes, There is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. Our Father, you know that this is a time of change for many, and not least for those who have received A-level results last Thursday, and those waiting for GCSE results next Thursday. Please, Lord, would they know your presence with them. Help them look to you, whatever the exam results. For those who are disappointed, may they have confidence that you have a good plan for them. They can still live with you as their loving Heavenly Father. And these times have not taken you by surprise, and you still have good works prepared in advance for them to do. For those who have received what they expected, may they still look to you and trust you in all the changes that lie ahead. And Lord, we pray that as we are living in a time of change with an uncertain future, may we continually remember that with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you wherever we are, whatever lies ahead. For Jesus' name's sake. Amen. The psalmist writes, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. Our Father, we pray that you would strengthen the hearts of those who are sick and suffering and those who grieve. Enable them to wait for you, to put their hope in your word, to deeply believe your promises, your promise to be with them always, your promise of eternal glory, for those who trust in Jesus, and would this give them strength to endure. We particularly name Rosie, David, Peppy, Terry, Joe, Ruth, Thierry, Ruth and David, and in a moment of quiet, others known to us. Our Father, please, may we all put our hope in you, for with you, the Lord, is unfailing love and full redemption. Thank you, Lord. Amen. On Thursday this week, we heard the very shocking news that our dear friend Edward Nelson had had a climbing accident in the Alps, and on Friday... The devastating news came through that he died. Edward was a much-loved friend to many of us. He was an apprentice here at St. Ebbs, served alongside his future wife, Laura. And for a number of years, they'd been doing tremendous work in Paris in church planting ministry. And all that time, they'd been overseas partners of us here at St. Ebbs in recent years, linked especially to Headington. And our hearts go out to Laura and to Nicholas, Samuel, Alexandra and Lucy, their children. It's impossible to know how 
the Lord can have let this happen, but we do trust that he's a God of complete love, who's in control. And uh, let's be praying very much for Laura and the wider family and their church family in Paris as they have to cope with this devastating loss. I'm going to lead in prayer now. Loving Father, we thank you for Edward, for every memory of him, for his deep love for you and faithfulness to you over many years, for his life as a faithful disciple, as a husband and father, as a friend, as a pastor. We pray very much now for Laura and for Nicholas, Samuel, Alexander and Lucy and the whole family as they cope with this loss. May they be very conscious in their extreme grief and their shock of your presence with them. We pray for the church family and we pray you protect them. And may this church continue to flourish and grow in the years ahead. Please bind them closely together as they comfort each other in their loss. And through this horror, somehow we pray, bring glory to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's so much in the world that we don't understand. There's so much that is miserable. And we long for the return of the Lord Jesus when all will be well. Our next song, we cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. Glory and power to the one who loves us. Honor and praise him forever. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus.
It's been so good over recent weeks and months to be joined by many of our overseas partners. And today we're going to be joined by our most recent overseas partner, Hannah Bossoff. Boss has finished as an apprentice just a few weeks ago, and I was able to commission her online just a couple of days ago when I could catch up with her, and she's going to tell us a bit more about what she's about to do. After we've heard from Hannah, she's going to read the Bible. John Chang will read the rest of the passage, and then Andrew will preach. Hannah, it's lovely to have you join us at a St. Ev's service, virtually at least. And uh, for those who don't know, you just introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Hannah. I've been at St. Ev's for the past six years. I first joined when I came up to Oxford as a student. I'm from the Netherlands. I have massively enjoyed uh, my time at Ev's uh, for the past six years. I worked uh, as an apprentice for the past two with international students and will be joining the kind of band of uh, international partners uh, from quite soon as I start studying uh, to train with Wycliffe Bible Translators. Well, we're very excited about that. And uh, this is your commissioning, as it were, as an overseas partner. And before I pray for you, just say a little bit more about uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators and what you're going to be doing in the, the shorter to medium term. Yeah, well, I love Wycliffe as an organisation, just their passion for people to hear the living God speak. Uh, think about that if uh, you were somewhere and you knew that there was a living God who spoke to you, but you couldn't understand him because apparently he doesn't speak your language. Um, well, God does speak to everyone and great to, in a little way, be part of uh, that work of sharing God's word with uh, everyone, uh, whatever language they, they speak. Uh, and that means for me that for the past, well, sorry, for the next five or six months, I will be spending some time uh, in Dorset studying to kind of prepare to go overseas, uh, hopefully firming up a placement as well in the meantime. And uh, yeah, getting ready uh, to, to go in around March time, hopefully. So do pray for that placement to come together. Pray I get a good start on studying and pray I really remember and trust that it's all God's work and look to him for it all. Brilliant. Well, we'd certainly pray. It's a tremendous vision to take God's word and translate it into all sorts of languages, which has done a, a wonderful work over the years. And we're just thrilled that you're part of it. And we're going to be part of it through you as we continue to support you in prayer. I'm going to pray in a moment, but let me read some words of the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Loving Father, we praise you for this commission of the Lord Jesus. And thank you for those who took the gospel to us and to our nations that we might come to know him. We praise you for the work of Wycliffe Bible Translators and Hannah's part in that, taking your word to nations and peoples all over the world. Please strengthen her in these days of big transition as she trains and then goes on this placement. Open just the right doors in the future for her to use her gifts to the full in the service of the gospel. And we thank you for this promise. The, the Lord Jesus says, I am with you always. May she know that to be true in her experience every step of the way, in the good times and in the harder times. And bless her richly and work in her and through her to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Brilliant, Hannah. Well, lots of love from all of us and we will be praying. We look forward to seeing you in the flesh in the future at some point, but of course none of us knows when that might be. All the best. Bye. Bye. This morning we will be reading from 2 Chronicles, chapter 32, verses 1 to 23. After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he had intended to wage war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. They gathered a large group of people who blocked all the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the king of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. 
Then he worked hard repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. He built another wall outside that one and reinforced the terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gates and encouraged them with these words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Later, when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and all his forces were laying siege to Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah, king of Judah, and for all the people of Judah who were there. This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? When Hezekiah says, the Lord our God will save us from the hand of the king of Assyria, he is misleading you to let you die of hunger and thirst. Did not Hezekiah himself remove this God's high places and altars, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before one altar and burn sacrifices on it? Do you not know what I and all my predecessors have done to all the peoples of the other lands? Were the gods of those other nations ever able to deliver their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me? How then can your God deliver you from my hand? Now do not let Hezekiah deceive you and mislead you like this. Do not believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my predecessors. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? Sennacherib's officers spoke further against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. The king also wrote letters ridiculing the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him, Just as the gods of the peoples of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hand. Then they called out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to terrify them and make them afraid in order to capture the city. They spoke about the God of Jerusalem as they did about the gods of the other peoples of the world, the work of human hands. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, Some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. He took care of them on every side. Many brought offerings to Jerusalem for the Lord and valuable gifts for Hezekiah, king of Judah. From then on, he was highly regarded by all the nations. Hello, my name is John and I'm a member of the 630 Congregation. Uh, I'm doing a DFL, a PhD in law, and I'm part of the thesis postgraduate community at St. Ems. I'm also very excited to share with the St. Ems family that I'm able to get married next month on September 5th to another member of the thesis uh, postgrad community at St. Ems, uh, Antje Carroll, and so we'd be really grateful if you could think about us on the day. Today's scripture reading is from 2 Chronicles, chapter 32, verses 24 to 33, if you're able to open your Bibles and turn there with us. That's 2 Chronicles, chapter 32, 24 to 33. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death, but he prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he did not respond to the kindness shown him. Therefore, the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart 
as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore, the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had very great wealth and honor, and he made treasuries for his silver and gold, and for his precious stones, spices, shields, and all kinds of valuables. He also made, value, uh, he also made buildings to store the harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil, and he made stalls for various kinds of cattle and pens for the flocks. He built villages and acquired great numbers of flocks and herds, for God had given him very great riches. It was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. He succeeded in everything he undertook. But when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land, God left him to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. The other events of Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion are written in the vision of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Hezekiah rested with his ancestors and was buried on the hill where the tombs of David's descendants are. All Judah and the people of Jerusalem honored him when he died, and Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I'm told that one of the Chinese words for crisis is comprised of two symbols, one meaning danger and the other opportunity. And you, of course, don't need me to tell you about the dangers of our current crisis. We feel them acutely, the medical threat, the political threat, as we begin to sense governments uh, under great strain around the world. And of course, the economic threat, which uh, so many here, even in the UK, are feeling. How much more so those in poorer parts of the world where the coronavirus has also taken hold, but with much less social support. We see the dangers, but understandably, it's harder to sense the opportunity which that Chinese framing of the word of, for crisis would have us look forward to. Thankfully, we're again looking at one of the kings in two chronicles as we go through our summer series. And today we come to King Hezekiah. And as we've seen in the reading, he's at a time of crucial crisis. The king of Assyria has already invaded Israel to the north and sacked Samaria, the capital, and now is beginning to press down into Hezekiah's nation of Judah and is already besieging fortified cities that uh, provide the final defense before the king of Assyria could come to Jerusalem. A great threat. The Assyrian army, one of the most ruthless, brutal, barbarous war machines this world has ever seen knocking on King Hezekiah's door. It's not hard to spot the danger. But this passage would have us see the opportunity. King Hezekiah clearly saw it and seized it, and we have chance to seize it as well. And ironically, this opportunity comes in the form of being forced to answer a question. Ironic because in this passage it comes on the lips of the enemy. Actually, on the lips of the messengers that King Sennacherib sends to King Hezekiah. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 10, this is the question. Will you let it search you? This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? Through his messengers, the king of Assyria asks it flippantly. On what are you basing your confidence? Do you not know all the other nations that I've taken hold of, and yet you would resist me? They all had their gods too. What would make you think that your God could protect you from me when I've already had so many? He asks it flippantly. But Hezekiah took it seriously. And we're to take it earnestly. On what are you basing your confidence at this crucial time of your life, of our nation's life, of our world's life, the greatest crisis 
that our world has faced since the Second World War. Amidst it, on what are we basing our confidence? God would have us ask today. Let's turn to him in prayer before we go deeper into this incredible story. Father, we do thank you for the riches of your word. We look to you and ask for your Holy Spirit's help. We want to place our confidence in you, God. We're so often tempted to place our assurance in things other than you. Please today, would you point us to the Lord Jesus Christ and show us what it would mean to place our confidence to you and on you in this crucial time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Of course, some key differences between the crisis faced then and the one we face now. Then the people of God, of course, uh, were a nation which after the reign of Solomon split into two uh, kind of sister nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south with their own kings. And they were political entities. And then the threat was a political enemy, the king of Assyria coming with the sword. But now, of course, the people of God under Christ are comprised of people from many different tribes and tongues and nations. And wonderfully, at the end of days, we're trusting that people from every tribe and tongue and nation will be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. So the people of God as the church today are not one national enemy and uh, uh, entity and not one uh, political kind of governing body like the nation of Judah was then. And our enemy, we're told today in the New Testament, does not come in the form primarily of flesh and blood, but amidst the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly realms, the principalities and powers of Satan and his dark realm, our enemy, we're told by the Apostle Paul. And the enemy of sin, which besieges us from within as our enemy. These enemies, of course, can't be faced with, with, a, with a physical sword. No. We're told in the book of Revelation that we face these enemies. We overcome the enemies of God today by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the word of our testimony to him. So very, very different situations in one sense, but the opportunity, as we've seen, very much the same. And whenever the Church of God faces a great crisis, as we do today, it does push us to answer this question. What are we putting our confidence in? I know if you're a Christian person, you want to pray and place your confidence in the Lord, but what would that mean? Well, we received two answers from Hezekiah's life. The first is, God's people amidst crisis place their confidence in him when they clean up God's house. And the second is, God's people show their confidence in him by, yes, preparing practically, but by also praying amidst their crisis. So first, God's people place their confidence in him amidst crisis by cleaning up God's house. We could so easily miss it. 2 Chronicles 32, beginning at verse 1. After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. Now that line there, after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, harkens back to the preceding three chapters. Sadly, Hezekiah's dad, King Ahaz, was not at all exemplary in his following of the Lord. Near the end of his life, he actually closed the temple after piling in it all sorts of unclean things. And he encouraged idolatry throughout the land so that high places uh, for worshiping idols were spread throughout Judah when Hezekiah took the throne at the age of 25. God's house in ruin. But right at the beginning of his reign, we're told that Hezekiah opened up the temple and began to clean it out. 
He took eight days for, for him and his people to work their way into the temple and clean it, even into the portico, the, the initial opening porch, and then another eight days to get right into the temple and finish the cleansing. This is what Hezekiah does at the very beginning of his reign, focusing on God and faithful worship of him. And then he reinstitutes the Passover, which had not been had for many, many a year. And he not only invites people from throughout his land of Judah to come to the Passover feast, but he extends the invitation to the north and invites people from that realm that had split off from Judah to come down to the Passover feast. And so we're told, not since the time of Solomon was a Passover held in Jerusalem like the one that Hezekiah held. The reason not only being because it was a great festival, but because it was a festival that finally brought again together the two nations which had split apart. He cleans out God's house. He reinstitutes the Passover and he begins to take down those high places, initially in Jerusalem, and then through, throughout Judah, the high places are taken down, and instead the people are encouraged to offer the proper worship that they were to worship to Yahweh. Hezekiah cleans up God's house. He gets things straight with God in the life of his nation. And what we need to realize is that for much of this kind of time of faithfully reinstituting worship of Yahweh, the king of Assyria was right there up in the north uh, as, as an enemy about to, to encroach. Now, it took 14 years of Hezekiah's reign before the king of Assyria actually pressed down into Judah. And for that time, Hezekiah was restoring worship of God. Imagine what it must have sounded like, you know, in the Nineveh Telegraph, for example. How much space do you think it got on the front page that Judah was refreshing its worship of Yahweh? What, one paragraph? Maybe two? And to the world uh, outside these walls, might it seem silly that our first response as a church would be to turn earnestly to God? Might they wonder what difference might that make amidst this crisis? But for God's people, it should go without saying. Turning to him, allowing the crisis to search whether we're actually following the Lord as we should is of first importance. Are we worshiping the Lord as we should as a church? Am I devoting myself to him wholeheartedly, personally? Am I obeying him? and seeking to follow him? Am I letting his word rule over my life and seeking to walk with Jesus with other Christians, me supporting them and them supporting me? That's the first step in trusting the Lord and placing our confidence in him amidst times of crisis is to clean up God's house and ask him to sift it and to make sure that we're seeking him and following him as we should. My daughter, Anna, was playing with Legos the other day, and she had made a wonderful Lego city, and she asked me to play with her. And so as a good dad, what did I do but take one of the pre-made Lego planes that was there and remove the top from it and fill it with a bunch of Legos. And I kind of zoomed in on her Lego city and, and dumped the plane over and almost bombed it and then came around for another assault and, and crashed into her Lego city and created a bunch of havoc, uh, just having some fun with her. And what did Anna do? but started to clear out all the mess that I had made and started to restore the city that she had built. She took that plane that had crashed in and she smashed it and threw it aside and began to rebuild. And the Lord's calling his church in the midst of crisis to first of all assure that we're placing him first and worshiping him as we should after all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done. He cleaned up God's house. 
Today, uh, the church being a God's people, God's house being the people of God, his church, we're asking him to search us as well and ensure that we're right with him. But the second uh, way that Hezekiah places his confidence in God amidst crisis is that he practically prepares even as he prays. He practically prepares even as he prays, prays. Praise. You can't miss his preparations in the passage. As the king of Assyria presses into Judah, he immediately uh, begins to prepare in Jerusalem. The fortified cities on the borders of Judah are under siege, and he attends to Jerusalem, knowing that's eventually where the king of Assyria will come. He first cuts off the water supply that would uh, feed the Assyrian army once they reach Jerusalem. Why should we give it to our enemy? And he he works with his officials to see that that takes place. He begins to build up broken sections of the wall and starts to even build another wall around the original wall and completes that. Imagine the preparations that went into that. He gathers his military officials and places them over uh, the, the soldiers to prepare for the advance to come. Look at the preparation that's going into Hezekiah's confidence in the Lord. Look at how diligent and faithful he is in doing what he knows that he should do to prepare. And you would almost think that as he does that and begins to speak to his his officials, that he place emphasis on the preparations that he's just made. But look with me at chapter 32, verses 6 through 8. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate and encouraged them with these words. Be strong and courageous. And you might think that here he'd say, because we've done these these great preparations to get ready for the king of Assyria. But no. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of the flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. So even as he prepares, he's still looking to the Lord. And the key difference he sees between himself and the king of Assyria is that the king of Assyria is relying upon what he calls the arm of the flesh, upon his chariots and his his vast army. But even as he makes diligent preparation, Hezekiah is coming from a vastly different spiritual frame. He's looking to God. And even as he prepares, He knows it's only God that will deliver. He prepares. And he not only practically prepares, he prays. As the king of Assyria makes his taunt, we're told that Hezekiah and Isaiah took the taunts of the king of Assyria to the Lord in prayer. We read that in uh, 32 chapter, verses 19 through 20. Look with me. They spoke about the God of Jerusalem as they did about the gods of the other peoples of the world, the work of human hands, the Assyrians did. And the response to this crisis, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. They prayed. How would that seem to the world around us to respond to this crisis with prayer? The church of God should be calling out and saying, let's turn to God in prayer. So let's begin here. Let's respond by saying, God, we can't handle this crisis on our own. We look to you to deliver us and use us to share your light in this world. You say, I know, Andrew, I know I'm meant to be praying. I find it so much easier to address the practical matters and to seek to prepare for various things as best I can. But to pray is a real struggle. 
And here's where Hezekiah can be such an encouragement. Because even though he got it wrong at other times in this passage, we're told at the beginning of his reign, back in chapter 29, that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. As his father, David, had done. Other kings that had done well were told that they did as well as their immediate fathers had done. Uzziah, for example, is that said of him. But here, of King Hezekiah, we're told that he did right as his, king, his father David had done. He's clearly held up, even despite his blunders. Yes, he does right. When he gets ill, we're told in uh, 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 32, uh, uh, verse 24, he prayed. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. He does right. But at other times, he messes up. We're told that the, the king of Babylon came in 32, verse 31. But when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask Hezekiah about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land, God left to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. And he shows the king of Babylon on all his great wealth. And he doesn't pause to pray and seek wisdom from God. He's proud in his heart. But we're told finally that when Hezekiah did become proud, he repented. We see that in verse 26. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart, and as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. And so not a perfect faith. He prepared practically, and he prayed, but he didn't always get it right. And yet God was able to use him. So Friend, here's what it looks like to place our confidence in the Lord at this crucial time. First, we, we cleanse out God's house. We ask him to search us as his people. And then we prepare practically and we pray. Let's turn to God in prayer now. Lord Jesus, we worship you as the perfect king who didn't stumble and always placed his trust in God our Father. We worship you, Lord Jesus, and pray that your will would be done in your church at this time. We look to you now and pray that you would be our vision, the one that we trust in, the one we put our confidence in, whatever the trial is that we face. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
I'm so glad that you joined us. And as you go into the next week, may you be conscious of the loving, sovereign God who cares for you and is with you. Let's close our service by saying together these words. To him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and for evermore. Amen. <laughs>